All right. Wow. Well, last week, uh, we talked about armor. We, we talked about spiritual armor. We learned that we are in a spiritual battle. Whether we like it or not, it's on. We also learned that we are either citizens in a war, and in that, that we are victims, we are weak and unable to fight, or we are a special ops team fighting an invisible army, humans battling evil forces that you can't see. We also learned that to be enlisted in this special ops army means that we've given allegiance to a king named Jesus, our battle commander. We've renounced or repented of things that we have done that have been opposition to him. And we've committed to live and serve under his kingship, becoming a patriot of a kingdom called heaven, to which we then belong and where we'll go one day. Once enlisted, we are geared up with the armor special armor, protection against the assaults of that spiritual enemy that we have. And we are trained in using the weapons, spiritual weapons of war. So the last thing we learned last week was that we're not fighting alone. We're soldiers in an army, and we have this army all around the world that stands with us, shield to shield, shoulder to shoulder, holding a line of defense. Now today, we're going to look more closely at the enemy's weapons and strategies. Now I'm not one to focus on the enemy. I, I want us to focus on Jesus. But as soldiers, we have to be aware of our enemy, right? We have to be aware of the strategies used against us as we focus on Jesus. See, this isn't our, our power, our energy. It's a supernatural power we get from God to be able to do what we're doing in this war. But the Bible is really, really clear about the strategies and things that we need to be aware of to be able to fight properly. Now, if we've got this armor and we've got the weapons, there's a reason we need to put them on. And why are we putting them on? What are we fighting? And so today, I wanted us to take a look at that. I'm not going to go into huge detail because I know that as I speak and as I talk about the war that we're in, and the tactics and the weapons that the enemy uses, that the Holy Spirit, who is in you, is going to show you what battle you're in. And each of us is waging a war. Some of us are waging more than one war. And the Holy Spirit's going to show you today and continue to show you after this the, the battle you're in, what you're fighting, and how you're fighting it. God wants you to win. He's going to point it out to you so that you see it, you know it, and you're aware of the armor and the weapons you have to be able to gain your foot, footage, footing in this war and stand firm and do what you need to do. So this isn't all the... Um, I'm, not, I'm going to, not going to list all the weapons. I'm not going to even list all the strategies but I am going to go through a few of them. I'm going to go through a few that we'll, we'll be able to identify why we have the armor of God and why we need to use it. And I've started each one with a D. Um, I think subconsciously I did that because of D for demon, but <laughs> I'm not really sure. But I'm hoping that having them all in a D form will help us to remember them a little better too and to understand what we're, we're up against. So before we start, let's just pray. Lord Jesus, I, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for your spirit. And I thank you, Lord, that you have equipped each and every one of us who know you and love you with everything we need to be able to fight the battles that we have before us. And I know that we are victorious, and I thank you for this, and I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to just understand today the power you've given us through you your power by the cross. In your name, amen. 
All right, so we're going to start with Ephesians 6 again, uh, 10 to 18, while we're going through it. We're going to start with the belt of truth. And we did discuss the belt of truth and how it's important to wear that for our integrity. But the reason that we have a belt of truth is because Satan is opposing us. And when Satan opposes, he does opposite. So what would be the opposite of, of truth? Lies. Deception. Yeah, we got the D word going. <laughs> Deception. Satan is a deceiver. And Jesus called him the father of all lies in John 8, 44. He was talking about the devil. And he said that he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And he turns good and, and the things of God in, tries to turn them into bad, make us convinced that what good we know through God is, is not good. And what we know is wrong or evil is good. And he turns everything around backwards and opposite. And he's the master of turning lies into what looks like truth, deceiving people into thinking the lie is truth. Now, lies are bad enough, but deception is especially difficult. Because what deception does is it coats a lie with sugar. And I I had a picture in my mind when I was writing this. It's not just any sugar. It's like icing sugar. It's so smooth. It's so sweet. And we take that in because that's truth. That's righteousness. That's of God. But inside it, he's twisted something. He's made it into a lie hidden amongst the truth. Society is filled with these lies, coated in sweetness, lies coated in righteousness and filled with poison. Now, I wasn't going to go into much detail, and I'm not going to, but, but I'm, I'm thinking I probably need to explain at least one example of this so that you can understand what I'm saying, and then you can start to see it. You can start to see these things. And once you line up the Word of God, and once you know the Word of God and you know truth, then you're going to be able to see these a lot easier. So one of the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt not murder. Kill, murder. It's an intentional killing. So we know it's wrong. Does anybody here think that murder's right? Good. We're all on the same page. So if, if there's a, a child in a house alone and somebody breaks in and kills that child, is that wrong? Right. That's wrong. It's wrong. There's no justification. Is there any justification? No. But society has caused us, the enemy has caused society, to believe that an unborn child can be killed on a whim. And we justify it. We justify it with all sorts of, of horrible things that have happened to the mother. We justify it with inconvenience, with poverty, with um, a child that may have um, handic a handicap. We justify, 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 justify to be able to do what Satan wants us to do. And that's just one. The, the society we have right now is filled with these things that go against what God wants us to do, are strictly against what God wants us to do or believe in, and he covers it with something that seems right, something that seems just, something that seems merciful. I am thinking, too, of um, medically-assisted suicide. Let's go there. Merciful. Merciful and kind to be able to stop suffering. There is the sugar. Did you know that 10,000 people in Canada last year availed themselves of that service? 10,000 people died. And I actually heard story about a woman who had decided she wanted to, but she didn't qualify because it didn't quite meet the criteria. But her, her story is that she was glad because 
just a few months later, she realized how much she wanted to live. And she was so grateful. It's a slippery slope. A an abortion started with trauma to a mother, a horrible, vile act against a woman as justification. And it's come now to abortion can be done up to birth. Wha mark my words, it's going to be beyond that. It's going to go beyond that. And assisted suicide, it's for mercy, but I mark my words, it will go beyond that. And Satan deceives us into one small step at a time, going one small thing to another, and pretty soon... So we need to be able to stand up against deception. We need to be able to know what it is. We need to be aware of what God says is truth in his word and hold to it. In the Garden of Eden, the serpent convinced Eve, though she knew it was wrong, to eat the fruit. He convinced her to eat the fruit because he convinced her that what was going to happen was going to be good for her. Knowledge of good and evil. There's nothing wrong with knowledge. What's wrong with knowledge? That's a good thing. In fact, there's people now saying Satan was a good guy because he, he allowed us to know good and evil. That's how bad it's gotten. But she took it. She believed it. And she even, in that moment, put herself as smarter than God. She felt that if God said no, but she'd be knowing good and evil like God? Well, what's wrong with that? We will justify doing evil. We will justify opposing God because the enemy of our soul will cause us to have a reason to sin. We'll have a reason to do what we shouldn't be doing. Ephesians 6.14, the breastplate of righteousness. In Matthew 13.22, uh, the story is about seeds being cast into the ground and, and what happens to them. And in Matthew 13, 22, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word out, making it unfruitful. So in Ephesians 6, 14, um, it speaks about the breastplate of righteousness. And so what happens is we get distracted from doing the right thing. So the, the second word, the second weapon under D is distraction. Because the cares of this world, living to work, um, being too busy, doing good things, will cause us to not do what God wants us to do. To do the right things. And the right thing is to put God first in our life. If we take our eyes off God and the things of God and place it on other things in this world, even things that aren't bad, they're good things. then it's the wrong order. It's just the wrong order. God has to be first in our life. And distractions are always an excuse for not investing in our relationship with Jesus. And if we're not careful, that distraction weapon will be like those thorns and weeds, and it will choke out our faith. So the way we fight this weapon is by wearing that breastplate of righteousness, doing what's right, not just what's convenient in the moment. I've, I've talked to many people who said that they just don't have time to pray. They don't have time to read the Bible. Well, it's like budgeting. If you can't afford something, take a look at what you're spending your money on. If you haven't got time for Jesus, then, then your, your world is going to be off kilter. Number three, Ephesians 6.15 the shoes of readiness of the gospel of peace. What takes peace away? What weapon? So we talked about a little bit last week. It's disunity. Now we could have a whole bunch of things that will take our peace. But I, I chose disunity. Because disunity creates division. And division is a weapon that's fought with the shoes of the gospel of peace. Satan doesn't want us feeling peace. And he doesn't want it any of us to bring peace to our situations. He wants to stir up miscommunication, misunderstandings. He wants to, to create or encourage hurt. He wants gossip. He wants slander. He magnifies an offense. 
He uses our sinful natures to divide believers. And he knows that if we divide, we fall. Mark 35, 25, it's clear. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And, and it's not just church, as I was kind of talking about last week. It's, it's everything. It's every relationship. It's anything good, any kind of connection that we have with each other, that's strength and power against the enemy. And he hates it. He wants to create disunity. He wants to put in a wedge in amongst people, in amongst couples, in amongst uh, parents and children, and children and parents, against other believers, against friends, everybody he wants a wall between. Because if we're together, we're stronger than he is. And he hates it. So God is clear in the Bible on how to handle this weapon that is being used against us. Ephesians 4.1 says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. We must fight division. We must fight it. We must bring the peace of God into our differences. Romans 12, 18 says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If we don't realize what's happening, if we stand on, well, I'm right, they're wrong, and it's their issue if we're having division, if we don't bring reconciliation, if we don't work at having peace, if we don't try to listen, if we don't try to communicate effectively, if we don't become humble instead of self-righteous, then we're not going to stand. And that's in every relationship. That's not just here in any churches, though he he deliberately tries to divide people in churches. He hates it. But families, look how many families are crumbling. Look how many divorces are happening. Look how many relationships are dissolving. Ephesians 6.16 says, Taking up the shield of faith to extinguish the fiery arrows of the evil one. Now, I, I did allude to this last week about how those arrows are shame and condemnation and, and guilt. I've, I've put it down as disgrace. We feel disgraced. And he uses this weapon of disgrace and shame because it brings with it condemnation, depression, hopelessness, and the effect will destroy us because, like a burning arrow, it will hit us and burn us from the inside. It burns our soul. When we have condemnation and guilt, we hide away from people. We don't go out. We, we feel this, this shame inside of us, and we pull away from people. And it burns us from the inside. We writhe in emotional pain. And with this weapon, which is described as a fiery arrow, we sustain major internal injuries emotionally and spiritually. And we need to understand in John 10.10, 10, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He steals our peace of mind. He steals our confidence in God and in his forgiveness. He kills our joy, and eventually he will kill, he will destroy our faith. And the answer to this weapon, to defeat it, is the shield of faith. And there's something I've added to this because this is huge. There's so much depression. There's so much discouragement. There's so many emotional problems that people are having. We are under major attack. Whether we're Christian or not Christian, humanity is under attack. Uh, there's something we got to know. One day, child of God, we are going to have the authority over angels. 
If Satan can make you feel discouraged and depressed and despairing, you'll never realize the supernatural power that you have in God. He's given you a supernatural ability to fight this. He wants to see us stand strong, but Satan wants to see us think we're weak. And Satan wants us to feel powerless. And honestly, in and of ourselves, we are, we are very weak. We are very powerful, powerless. We have no power. But only through Christ do we have that power. But unless we access that power, we're weak and powerless. And as long as Satan can make us believe that, that we are not worthy of it or that um, we think of ourselves and our own issues, then we'll never turn to God for that power. We'll never access that supernatural power to fight with. But we've read the end of the story. We win. We got this. So we can't give up. We mustn't give up. We need to keep on with this good fight, this fight of faith. Satan's end will be bitter and ours will be glorious. We are the head, not the tail. We have victory. And yet, sometimes we walk around like we don't. Did you know that Isaiah foretells the imprisonment of evil angels in Isaiah 24, 21 to 22? Now, it's not going to be on the screen, but I'll read it to you. On that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven, not punish them in heaven, but those that are in heaven, um, in the atmosphere, as I described it uh, yeah, last week. And the kings of the earth and the earth is going to punish them too. They'll be gathered together as prisoners in a pit. They will be shut up in a prison and after many days, they will be punished. Do you know who stands to judge these evil angels and these evil people who are on the earth? You and I. Did you know that? We stand in judgment. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 to 3. Or do you not know that the Lord's people, it's us, will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things in this life? So you get it? He wants us, he's an abuser. He wants us to believe that we have no power. He wants us to believe that we are losers. He's trying to convince us that, that we have nothing. Because if we ever, ever realize how much power we have in the Lord and how much victory we have in him, then we're going to be able to fight. And we will defeat him. And one day, he will be judged by us. So he wants to deceive us and depress us and make us weak or make us think we are. So we need to take up that shield of faith and extinguish those fiery arrows. And we have Ephesians 6, 17, the helmet of salvation. The, the next word I have for that weapon is dread. It's fear. Satan uses fear. It's a powerful force. Especially fear that drags on with this impending sense of doom. Despair. And dread takes our eyes off of faith and puts our focus on the storm that we sense or know is coming. It leaves our body and our spirit weak and immobilized, even if that thing that we're fearing never happens. The use of fear is an ancient battle tactic. The Assyrians used the tactic in Jerusalem in 2 Corinthians uh, third, the Chronicles sorry, 32, 18. And it says, then they called out in Hebrew to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to terrify them and make them afraid in order to capture the city. If you can induce dread in someone before the battle begins, you've won the war before it starts. If we are terrified of the enemy, if we are fearful of the things in this world, if we have that dread and that fear and that anxiety and that stress, it's because we're in a war. It's because Satan wants us to believe that there's no hope in this. He's, he's 
trying to get us to choose fear over faith. There is no room for fear and faith to live together. One has to win. Let it be faith. Stand firm, child of God, because fear is not going to help you. It will bury you. Stand firm in faith. So the weapon fought uh, that we, we fight with is the helmet of salvation. And the reason that is, is because you know that weakness you feel when fear overtakes you? Anybody ever had that where you just feel your, your life force draining out of you with that anxiety or that fear of something, that bad news, whatever? It's because of what our mind is telling our emotions and our, our bodies responding. Our mind is controlling what's happening to the rest of us. And so we need to take our thoughts captive. We need to put on that, that helmet of salvation. We need to resist the negative assault upon our mind and replace it with the truth of God's word in our mind. Because it's only God's word that's going to bring us that peace we're looking for. We need to believe it. We need to hold on to it. When we feel helpless and terrified, recognize you're under assault. And if that's happening, fear might be winning in the moment. But you recognize it, and now you can fight. The attack is where the helmet of salvation is necessary. Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I encourage you, stand firm with the helmet of salvation, protecting your mind. Ephesians 6, 17, again, sword of spirit. And the last word here is doubt. Doubting God's care. Doubting his provisions and his promises, his protection. Doubting his forgiveness. If allowed to grow, doubt breeds distrust. Distrust in God. And distrust and doubt take us away from God. If we begin to doubt him, we'll start to judge him. Did you know that? Every time we doubt him, we're judging him. Every time we say, well, he's taking too long. He isn't listening. He didn't answer the way I wanted. My prayers aren't, aren't being answered. And we think because it didn't happen the way we wanted to, he's not listening. And we doubt we doubt his goodness towards us. And that's judging him. Because we're saying, if it was me, I would have answered that prayer. If it was me, that never would have happened. What kind of God would allow this to happen? That's a judgment statement. So we need to trust God. Because if we don't, and we start to distrust him, you know what we do? We put somebody else in his place. We put something else in his place. We want a prayer answered, and it's not coming fast enough. Well, we look to somewhere else to get it. We try to make that happen. Well, God didn't answer his prayer, so it must mean I need to do this. Our timing, our judgment, we need to trust God, not doubt him. We need to hold on to God's word, the sword of the spirit his promises. And when the enemy hits you with a weapon of doubt, hit him back with scripture. Hit him head on. And I, I'd like to remind you too that when Jesus was in the desert, do you remember the story where Satan came to him and, and tried to get him to do all sorts of things? Tried to deceive him, tried to, to get him to listen to him? And Jesus was hungry 40 days and 40 nights in that desert, not eating and Satan came to him at his lowest point, what did Jesus do? He fought with scripture. Deuteronomy, to be exact. And at one point, of course, the enemy knows scripture, and he threw Psalms at him. Jesus threw Deuteronomy back at him. It was a sword fight. And that's how we need to fight. That story, that understanding 
of what happened between Jesus and Satan in the desert is an example of what we need to do. It's not in there just for an interesting story. He's teaching us. He's teaching us how to fight. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Trust. Don't lean on your own understanding. Hold the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and use it against this weapon of the enemy. Read. Take in. Memorize scripture. Have it ready. Jesus didn't say, hang on a second, I gotta Google this one. Or he, he knew it. He knew it, and he stood on it. And we need to. Because when the enemy attacks, he knows scripture. And he will twist it around. We need to know it. Memorize it. Hold on to the scriptures that are promises that you can hang on to and recite whenever that thought comes into your mind that God is not listening. And lastly, as I close, I would like to encourage us to be so passionate for God and so adept in this spiritual battle that every morning when we get up, the devil freaks out and says, oh no, the Christian's up. Amen? Amen. Okay, well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for, for giving us your word and showing us how to wear the supernatural armor. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't just leave us here waiting for you to come back. You've equipped us. You've equipped us to fight. Thank you, Lord, that, that you are our strength. You are our shield. You are our hope. And in you, we are victorious. So I thank you, Lord, for this. And I pray as we go from here today that each and every one of us will take up the arms, take up our arms, take up the armor, and fight the good fight. That one day when we stand before you, we'll hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, close with a...